Hello, everybody. This is episode 24 of the Aviation Spotters Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Moser. Hope you guys thoroughly enjoyed last week's episode with Anthony Ferrone. Man, wasn't he... He just radiated passion, didn't he? It's, you could just feel the passion in his voice about this stuff. And I honestly loved having that interview with him and just talking with him. He just... He, does, he knows so much at his age. Man, that was just an awesome, awesome, awesome interview. He was really passionate about aviation and the aviation photography community. But if you guys haven't had a chance to go listen to it, please go listen to it. Um, he is, like I said, very, very passionate, and you can really feel it in his voice. Well, you know, we had the two guests that were on the East Coast, and... I wanted to go a little bit further east, so I'm, I texted a friend of mine from uh, from Europe, and we are going to interview him today. So if, it is my pleasure to introduce one of my very good friends from Munich, Germany, Mr. Florian uh, Spielberg. I completely <laughs> um, butchered that. I am so sorry. <laughs> it's cool. It's um, it's Schulenberg, like the school, the Berg, and the uh, and the hill, like Schulenberg. Oh, okay. If you want uh, to try, if not, just introduce me as Florian. Um, we'll, before we'll butchering keep... any German names. <laughs> or I can <laughs> just say it myself. <laughs> That's just, we'll keep the German talk to you. Um, is I not, I don't, I very, I don't know much German, so I'll just, I'll just keep any long German words to you. <laughs> and so. No worries, mate. It's a, it's a hard question, a hard language to, to speak. It is. I heard, you know, it's, what, if you, it's very phonetic, so if you screw up on, like, a vowel or something, it can mean something completely different, right? Ooh, tough question. <laughs> Possible, yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't think of any examples, too. Um, anyway, man, thanks for agreeing to come on. I know, uh, timing-wise for us, we are, I believe, eight hours apart, so it's currently about 9.30 in the morning here in Boise and around 5.30 p.m. there in Germany. So I appreciate your coordination to come on the show. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's it's an honor to be here. Uh, very cool. Thank you. Let's get started, dude. So, where are you from, and how did you get into aviation photography? Uh, yes, so, so I'm from Munich, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm currently 20, 20 years old. Um, the question how I got into photography is pretty much my dad's best answer for it. And he once took me to the airport. Let's let's take some photos of the aircrafts landing and departing, and that's pretty much how it started. It's like probably very similar to many to many aviation photographers out there. Um, you just happen to have a father that's just going to take them to the airport, probably have a camera, just a coincidence or something, and just start doing it. Um, I guess with with time come, it, it got it increased. The, the hobby was it getting very much important within my life, within my school life especially, when I used to, to try to not spend the hours at school, but to try to get to the airport as soon as possible when there's something special. Um, yeah, so, so that's pretty much like five and a half years ago. Um, so I'm spending too much time to sell you for five and a half years, uh, probably. We also we also met back in twenty sixteen in September up in Minneapolis just by chance. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was a coincidence for you. I was I was changing the the location to take photos from, and uh, we happened to meet on, on a car park, I guess, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. it was a yeah parking garage. We were. Uh, you're you're on a bike and you're <laughs> visiting some family, I believe. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, that's a little tidbit about that. You know, never you're going to meet in a parking garage. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, it was it was, uh, it was a fantastic spot, I think, though. Like the oh, the angles oh, yeah. were awesome for for the departing aircraft in Minneapolis. It was a very cool spot. The backdrop was pretty awesome as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, none of the uh, MDs took off on that runway but we got them landing which now looking back at those photos it's like dang all those mad dogs that we got they're they're gone i mean for me as european pretty much every single aircraft departing was a special like even the spirit airlines a320 something that i didn't use to get anywhere else <laughs> oh wow i mean well what else you know it's you got seven fives you don't get those over there that very often seven sixes depending on cargo uh, capacity seven, seven sixes is Probably pretty pretty often seen in, in Charlie Gould, Paris, for example, in Amsterdam, sometimes Frankfurt, I believe. Um, Berlin used to get those Delta 767s. Um, but yeah, like ev everything smaller than an A330, for example, is like nothing we get at Europe. At least not from yeah. the airlines. 
very big specials for us, of course, is the, the FedEx MD, MD10, MD11s, for example. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's something we don't have at all. And then we also, well, we got the Air France A340s that day also. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like, that was a big one as well. They slowly phased them out. Uh, I like kind of after we spotted those, which is pretty pretty cool. Looking back at what we spotted, it's, it's pretty amazing how many aircraft just withdrawn from the skies in the past two years with, with COVID hitting the airline industry very hard. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, now that we're going to go back to those photos, like, dang, I remember when I got those. Plus, we got some American Mad Dogs, too. Yeah. Which, hey, that was even better. Yeah, I think they were phased out like half year after it or something. Uh, 2018. No, 2019, because that was the right before oh. the world went to shit. Oh, three because, years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when, the, when, when American decided to retire the Mad Dog, that's when the world went to shit. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> so, American, if you're listening, bring them back, please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, let's see. You've been doing this for five and a half years. Your dad got you into all this. Uh, and, um, well, so what would we consider your home airport, then? Uh, home airport is definitely a Munich airport. Um, it's the airport I spend most of the time at. Um, as it's the most close by from, from my home, it's like just 20 minutes of a drive, so it's very cool. Well, before we, we, we go into like your other hobbies and stuff like that, um, I want to ask, I didn't, I didn't put this on the question list, but compared, so you spotted in the United States and you, and you spot in Europe. What are, the, what are some big differences of European plane spotting versus American plane spotting? Hmm, tough question. Um, this is different sides of that of the answer, I think. I mean, uh, one part is definitely I've got into more trouble with police in the US. Um, for example, when you're spotting at, at Houston, for example, we have had some contact with the police. Um, even back in Chicago, I get, get some trouble with the police just standing on a parking lot that they want, didn't want me to, to use for plane spotting. Um, so I guess it's probably more chill out. As far as the community goes, I think it's hard to tell. Um, there's huge communities here in Europe for plane spotting. You, know, you tend to, to meet so many people at pretty much every airport you're going to. Um, but I suppose it's the same for the, U for the US. I'm not sure what's, what's different about it. I mean, it's, it's probably going to be very similar. Uh, maybe it's a little bit easier to find spots in Europe as you can pretty much just walk up to any fence and uh, climb a ladder and try to get, take, to, take photos from there. I'm not sure if that's so easy in the US. Apart from, of course, very different traffic, we do, do, we do, do not really have those, those much of cargo aircraft, for example, flying around in, within Germany or within Europe. But other than that, I think it's, it's pretty similar, I guess. Okay, because I know there are some airports in Europe that have like the little spotter holes that are like, cut into the fence and all that, where you can stick your camera through and all that. And I also know that there's a lot uh, a lot more people that that do it because it's more um, available i should say because you know some airports in the united states they're mainly a very um not spotter friendly i should say i know there are a few airports that are kind of going that way as anthony said in his episode last week mm -hmm. but yeah i mean there's a lot of people that ask me is you know what's the difference between spotting in europe and in compared to the us and you know i've had a guest from india on here and pen spotting is pretty much illegal in india I mean, I think plane spotting is very easy in Europe, and after all, most airports do even have like visitors' terraces, like spotting areas, especially Frankfurt, for example, is a very good example. They have several spotter platforms around the airport for, for very specific runways in use. Um, Amsterdam is perfect, they don't even have fences there, so you can pretty much just take photos with no obstruction or anything in between you and the aircraft. So some airports are really, really good to spot it, but... Um, I'd say mostly it's, it's very easy to spot in Europe. The only thing that might be easy in the US, uh, we're not allowed to technically use the ATC or listen to it. Uh, that's right, you guys can't use scanners or radios. You can't legally, but pretty much most of the people do. And thanks to Flightraff24, it's, it's, it's good enough to know which app, uh, aircraft will, which, well, will use which runway, <laughs> sorry. So, but apart from that, I think it's very similar. It's, it's, it's a very open-minded community, very, a ton of people are doing it, um, pretty much every age does it. Um, so it's a very cool and very big community. Yeah, that's the one thing I did forget about is uh, you're not supposed to use any radio devices that can intercept uh, aerial communications, which is kind of, kind of weird, but I mean, at, this, at the same time, yeah, do you guys have like the live ATC stuff over there? 
We do have it, but there's I think there's one or two airports in, in whole Germany that are available on there. Um, I think Amsterdam is is available on there, but it's, it's very very limited of use. Yeah, it's just pretty much like a like a it's clear to take off type type thing and stuff like that. I'm assuming. Yeah, it's 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 not really useful here. You, most people just buy a scanner somewhere and just use that with headphones plugged in. So, and of course the the community help. I mean, you can probably go to any airport and there's going to be someone working at the airport who has access to to the airport internal information. So whenever you need information, you can just ask people around you. So that's pretty easy here. Okay. Oh well, that well, works out too then. Well, that's that was an interest. That's an interesting talk. You know, um, hopefully that gives a little insight to the people that want to go spot over in Europe and stuff like that. And so, what other hobbies do you have outside of aviation photography? Uh, yeah, I'm a pretty big nerd. <laughs> um, I do computer <laughs> science and software engineering as a hobby and both and professionally. Um, so that's what I spend most of my time with. But photography is pretty much like my personal time off. Um, it's both car photography, automotive photography, and aviation. That's pretty much a perfect, perfect time to, to spend your time, like in, in free time, to enjoy the free time, um, to do something completely else, get some fresh air, for example. So that's pretty much what I spend most of my time with. Um, it's very limited. <laughs> and you also work for one of the world's largest auto manufacturers too, and uh, we don't have to say its exact name, but um, you know, I've seen some of your some of your photos from that and you're in the car and all that i'm like man i really wish you sold the euro spec cars in the u.s <laughs> sometimes it's a, it's a big honor especially when you're being able to to walk around the plants while you build those cars um to see the passion that every other customer brings with it it's, it's like aviation when you as a pilot see young kids walking around enjoying aviation and having a smile on the face all the time when they're flying um i think both industries have have the similarities in that aspect so it's, it's very cool yeah the one I, one of my bucket list goals is to go drive the Nürburgring and actually go to one of the Formula One races uh, either at Nürburgring or uh, Hockenheim. Oh yeah, those those are awesome. Like I, I'm a big Formula One fan. I've I've always been a big Formula One fan before. It became pretty popular in the U.S. I remember my dad waking me up at three in the morning back in <laughs> like the early 2000s, watching Michael Schumacher with the with the V10 Ferrari and the F2001 go out there and. You know, and that's one of my my favorite track of all time is Spa, right? So I'd love to do yeah. like hit hit like Spa and then do like the German Grand Prix and stuff like that, or like whenever it comes back because it's FAA the FIA is kind of weird about that. Definitely one of my goals is to make it over to over to Germany and drive the Nurburgring one day. Yeah, it's, it's a cool it's a cool race track. Have you driven the Nurburgring? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> it's it's on my bucket list as well. Um, but the point is that if you go to the Nurburgring, you're gonna have some kind of cool car for it. Uh, and so it's what you would do and should do is probably the, the tourist days where you can just take any specific car. I mean, you can find videos on YouTube where people drive their bus on there or they, the taxi or the cab or whatever you call it. <laughs> um, so you can find almost pretty much any kind of car on there on those tourist days. Um, you can take your very old Honda for a drive. You could take your Ferrari for a drive. Um, I think you pay like 25 bucks for a single lap on there. But it's definitely on bucket list. Uh, it's a very cool day, and you have those tourist days, both on the Hockenheim ring, for example, and the the Nurburgring. So whenever you're here, you might be looking forward to that. <laughs> I mean, twenty five oh, yeah. bucks for a single lap. It's it's not. It might. The Nurburgring laps aren't that short, so it's okay to pay that. I was about to say, like, it'll take you with all the traffic. At least it would take you, maybe fifteen twenty minutes to even get around. Because you know you're not going to go break any records on the track and stuff like that. You know you're not going to be flying around the corners in the absolutely in the carousel and stuff like that. And um, I mean, you know, so, or you just be like Sabine Schmidt and just take a van around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so whenever you have the time, just as on YouTube, you will find a ton of videos of people taking crazy vehicles on there. You can even drive some of our um, <laughs> DHL trucks on there. So it's very interesting <laughs> videos. That's pretty awesome. That's probably be awesome. Wait a minute, let's start moving to the more aviation-specific stuff. So let's talk about your camera gear, dude. Uh, what camera do you currently use and have used in the past? Uh, yes, I'm pretty much, thanks to my father, Nikon fan geek. Um, I'm f currently using the D500, which I think is an absolutely bonkers camera for plane spotting, as the APS-C sensor is pretty much perfect for it. Um, 
I've used the the D5500, which is like the smaller version and the kind of entry level version of the of the APC range with, with Nikon. If you're not familiar with it, that's pretty much all I've used yet. Um, and mostly uh, Sigma lenses, as pretty much they're just cheaper than the than the Nikon or Sigma um, uh, Nikon or yeah the original lenses that you might get for plane spotting. Oh, so what what uh, Sigma lenses do you have you used and currently used? Um, it's it's pretty much depending on where you are. Um, I mean, I do tend to do a lot of night photography within aviation. Um, so the stick on lens for that is mostly the seventeen to fifty millimeters, uh, which is like a perfect lens because you can get all the action that you need and you have the sharpest that you want. Uh, but for anything from outside of the airport, it's probably going to be the one hundred to four millimeters, which is an okay lens. It's it's not that perfect, um, but it's okay, especially for like I think eight hundred bucks is the price for it. Um, it's very cheap compared to the to the Nikon 80 to 400, which I think is two and a half thousand euros. So it's it's okay for that. Um, it's nothing special. It's not the best lens, but it's also not the worst. So it's it's perfect, I guess, for price for value. Now you can you can't go wrong with these Sigma and Tamron lenses right now. I mean, I know they're I mean they're not like as good as like Canon or Nikon glass, but you still can't can't complain about. You get a lot of bang for your buck with some of these lenses, and uh, the Sigma 100 to 400. Before I got my big, my big Canon lens, uh, I was actually looking at that one first. I'm like, I mean, it may not be able to afford the 100 to 400 Canon just yet, but um, I was looking at those. But uh, luckily, some financial stuff worked in my favor, and I was able to purchase that big lens. But uh, yeah, my, I mean, as we, as I said on the show multiple times, the, the D500 is one of the best crop body if not the best crop body uh, camera in, in the world to take this sort of stuff. And plus you got a really high frame rate too when you're taking photos, which you can't, can't really <laughs> complain about, like, especially like with something fast. The question is when do you really need those, those, the speed? I mean, if you're just standing at the random airport, you do, oh, for me personally, it's not the speed that's so awesome. I think it's the combination of the touchscreen, for example, which is very, very handy for, for still shots with the tripod. Um, it's the haptic is very great. It feels great. Um, the speed is good. The autofocus is awesome. So that's pretty much what what made me buy the camera. It's yeah, the speed is good, but when do you really need twenty images per second? <laughs> that is true. You know, I know you don't do a lot of like air show military photography, so you actually really did bring up a very good point. Is do you actually in those sort of situations actually need that really high buffer? So you put on even on the low buffer setting and get those strings of shots. I think the only time that you would maybe need that if it's like departing within a certain background and and you may or may not be sure you might get that background. So I think that's the only thing I could see sometimes when you're putting it up that high. Yeah, and the airship that you just mentioned, it's a very good point, um, especially when you're like standing around the math loop, for example, in Great Britain. That's probably something where you're going to want those 20 shots per second. That's a good example. Yeah, I mean, just, so just sitting at a normal spotting. Yeah, I can understand you don't really need the, the high the high buffer frame. Yeah, oh, interesting point. And I you know that's that's a lot of things that maybe a lot of people should consider is, you know, do you actually need that high rate of uh, high rate of speed just for shooting at an airport? A simple blue sky shot. I mean, for example, one of the big points that I never thought I would actually want in a camera is, for example, the touch screen. Um, for the past years, I've always said that why would you need a touch screen? You can just, just press the, the, the clicker by yourself and just take the photo yourself without using a touch screen. Uh, you don't need to actually adjust any settings of the camera, you can just do it with buttons. But what I found really useful is when you're like taking those two shots on the on the apron or whenever wherever you want. And by using a tripod when you don't really have to adjust the frame, you can just awesomely use the touchscreen to, to focus on specific areas of the image. So that's something I would probably not not gonna miss in the next camera I'm buying. It's it's a very awesome feature for like still shots where you have the time. <laughs> I love my touchscreen on my 5D, I, I, I was like, oh, this is a touchscreen, but I, I use the touchscreen so much more than I do the um, uh, just the regular actual buttons and all that. And what I also love too is how you brought up, you just like hit one simple, like you, if you're on, you can autofocus, you can literally touch whatever you need to focus on on the auto, on the thing, it'll, it'll, it'll autofocus, which is really awesome here than any night photography. You have to get the camera, you have to position it just right, and then to redo your the autofocus point, all that, but on like the touchscreen just go boop, 
Yeah. And autofocus. Yeah, totally. Beautiful. Were you, th were you thinking about that when you bought the camera? Was, was the touchscreen something that was the reason why you bought that very specific camera? Um, mine wasn't actually. Um, I just wanted a full frame camera that had a really good quality and the touchscreen wasn't even after the fact. My, honestly, I was thinking more about one of those articulating screens to be honest. That's what I wanted. Having that touchscreen really, really does make a difference. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, getting used to it. So, yeah, that's... Something like, once you have it, you don't want to leave it. <laughs> exactly. It's just like, oh man, this is awesome. I can't, I can't get rid of it. Just can't get rid of it just now. Yeah, absolutely. One well, minute. Anyway, uh, so now that we establish you're a Nikon D500 user with a Sigma 100 to 400 as your primary, so let's start talking about uh, specifics. All right. So, what is your favorite airplane to take to 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 photograph? Tough question, actually. Um, I mean, there's there's a ton of awesome planes, both technically or, or on the looks, on the sounds, for example. I think the the G9 and the Triple Seven, for example, sound fantastic it's a very distinctive awesome sound um but the the 747 for example the queen of the skies it's a very beautiful aircraft so it's hard to actually name like the coolest of the favorite aircraft however like from an over aspect i think the 777 just does it for me and the looks the the proportions of the wing to the body um especially with the new 777x that unfortunately i haven't spotted just yet <laughs> um yeah she's she's they're still Still putting around here in the U.S. Boeing delayed it again to 2022 for its introduction. Unfortunately, yeah. But those are very, very awesome aircraft. I think those are very beautiful. Yeah, no, you can't ever go around the triple seven, especially with the uh, uh, the GE90s. Yeah, just the sound when the aircraft is starting up at the airport, you can instantly tell it's it's the triple seven. And it's how it shakes the ground. Actually, you can kind of you can feel it when it starts up. We had a. United Triple Seven Three Hundred ER coming to Boise last year when I brought the uh, members to the Idaho Guard back home, and I remember when that thing started up, you could feel it across the whole entire airport when it just started going. Yeah, it's, and you it's could amazing. Feel shake. It's a really, really cool sound. <laughs> yeah, it it is. It is. Can never go wrong with the Triple Seven, especially like if you get it just right. I know, like, especially in Europe, it's a lot more humid than the U.S. or the West Coast. And you can get some pretty good like engine vapor and stuff like that too. Yeah, and yeah. A lot of cool vapor shots over there. Especially like the closer when the aircraft is landing or touching down, it's you can get really really cool shots of that. Well, what about your favorite airport to go spot at? Um, probably Munich. Um, just because of the reason that Munich is like super easy to spot at. Um, because both in the north and the south the south side, you have those fences that you can just walk up to wherever you want within the whole four kilometers of the runway. Position a ladder there and just take photos. But even apart from those two locations, you have like locations all over the place. There is parking garage that you can use. There is a visitor's hill that you can use. Um, the amount of location that you can use is just awesome. Um, doesn't really matter what where the light comes from, what aircraft you, you wanted to shoot. There's always something that you can use or work with to get awesome photos. And the traffic in Munich is not perfect. London, for example, gets a ton of awesome stuff every day. Um, Frankfurt gets more stuff than Munich. Amsterdam is a completely different matter than Munich. Um, but the amount of specials that we get, especially with the Munich Security Conference each year, for example, um, is pretty decent. Um, thinking about just the aircraft that we got in the last four or five years, like the, the Kyrgyzstan Tupolev 145, uh, 50, 54, sorry, um, the Burkina Faso Boeing 727, uh, which are very, very rare aircraft. Um, or for us, kind of rare at least is the E4B, for example. Um, so there's, there's cool traffic going on like all the time. If not every single day, at least once per week, you're going to have some cool aircraft to, to photograph. That's pretty awesome. And I, we will, I will talk about the Munich Security Conference here in, in a bit. I, would, I would do want to talk about that. But um, just for other like like a comparison sake how is frankfurt uh spotting like like uh compared to munich's um i think it depends on what you want to get um me personally i don't like sky shots i think like 90 degree sky shots those are good if you're a plane spotter looking for those registrations it's perfect but if you want to take a, 
it's very good photography a photograph that's like unique that's that's cool that's on the ground we can see like some kind of background or something i think munich is perfect because frankfurt you're gonna have a very few positions where you can actually use the background um very few locations give you perfect insight on you upon, upon the apron for example um so frankfurt has greater traffic more traffic uh, more runways um but also less cool positions in my opinion um, that are good for like special photos, let's say. And another good point for for Munich against Frankfurt is just the fact that we have two runways. Well, Frankfurt has three landing runways. Um, so it's it's. I mean, if you're a local, you're probably gonna know which aircraft is most likely to land on which runway. Um, but there's always ex examples why it doesn't why it doesn't work. And in Munich, you might just be able to change the runways within the approach of the aircraft it's probably going to take you five to ten minutes to, to change the runways to get at least kind of an emergency shot of a special aircraft that's landing in frankfurt when you know it's going to the northern runway instead of the southern runway i think you're lost it's got probably going to take you around 30 minutes to change the runway no chance so that's probably something why munich is awesome you kind of know which runway is going to be taken by what aircraft while it's in frankfurt at least for me there's a lot of lottery involved. That's really interesting to know. And you also brought up a good point. Aircraft spotting versus photography. I, and I have realized that there is a difference in Europe what spotting means and aviation photography means. Absolutely, yeah. So can, can you explain the difference of what I'm talking about? I think there's a little bit of a personal opinion involved into that discussion. Um, for me personally, plane spotting would mean that you try to get a specific aircraft that your focus on a photographer side is to, to photograph the aircraft uh, pretty much in any way possible. Just get the registration so you can log it. For me personally, an aviation photographer would be someone who's trying to get the best possible photo out of a specific aircraft. Um, best example would probably be um, we had a landing of an E4B two years ago or last year, I think two years ago. And plane spotters would just take the visitor's hill. Um, they would know, okay, they get a perfect shot of the aircraft. It's going to be a perfect shot and perfect light on a 90 degrees angle of the landing of the touchdown of that aircraft. Um, for me, it was more important to get a special shot even when I'm not being able to see the registration of the plane, for example. So I was like several other people positioning myself closer to runway to get a like close up landing shot from the front of the aircraft. Whilst the, let's say typical plane spotters would just use the, the Southern Visitor Hill to get like the plane in a, as a perfect picture, 90 degrees where you could actually see the plane. At least for me, that would be the difference between plane spotting and aviation photography. I know uh, when I had the Qatar episode, um, I was he helped me, and a very I'm very thankful he helped me kind of hype the episode. And one of the comments on it was, the guy said, "Oh, I'm not going to listen to your episode. It's about spotting." And I'm like, "Okay." Well, then I come to find out that spotting back in the day was a derogatory term in England for people that take photos of aircraft. Or at the time. They are also called, as, as I call them here in the States, loggers, mm -hmm. where they just turn right down the registrations and all that. Yeah. And I know in England and other places, or not just England, but in other places around the world, that's what a spotter is, is they spot the aircraft to get the registration. Instead so of an aviation photographer who actually goes and takes photos of the whole aircraft as a whole and doesn't really care about the registration that much. What I've found to be interesting is um, I've mostly seen this in at Heathrow in London. Um, there's numerous people just sitting there without even, don't even having a camera, just sitting there using binoculars to like see the registration and making a ticket in their book. That's it. So that's probably what you're referring to as loggers. <laughs> yep, that's it. Actually, I actually experienced a few of those guys in the US uh, a couple of years ago. They had some, uh, uh, we had some F5s out here and they wanted to know the registrations of the F5s. So. Um, I just ran to them in the parking garage there from England, and I was like, okay. And yeah, that's that's one thing I did want to clarify is is there's a difference between aviation photography and actual plane spotting in certain parts of the world. Um, obviously, I, I didn't know that at the time after some research, but who, I mean, who really cares at this point, right? We're all trying to look at airplanes and take photos of airplanes, or you know, yeah, totally. So 
at the end of the day, we're all we're all on the same boat. So whether they like the name or not, it's what you are. Exactly. Uh, let's just keep moving the moving this train on. Munich to Spot. Did you did they get triple sevens? Uh, with the with the triple sevens three out of the two hundred LR, uh, LRF or the three hundred ER in Munich. Yes and no. Um, we did use to get a I think three United seven seven sevens per day. Um, at least up to three sometimes. Um, those were the two hundreds. Um, we did use to get the Emirates triple seven daily twice. Uh, three hundred ER. Um, which eventually has been replaced with uh, a double A380 service um, every day. Um, we used to get uh, Qatar Airways 777s, we used to get uh, FedEx 777 freighters, but we also did use to get the, the ATH 777 from time to time, but with, with changing fleets on, on those airlines, we do mostly use to get like uh, the 787s or the A350, for example, from Qatar Airways um, instead of the 777. So, okay. sevens are limited, just like the 747, for example, it's, it's getting at least somewhat of a rare aircraft to spot here. Mainly, I'm assuming the 74 is in a cargo configuration, not a lot of passenger anymore. Yeah, even, even for cargo aircraft, Munich is, is, is not receiving many 747s. We do have, right now, the, the National 747, um, I think every t- two or three days, depending on the delay. <laughs> Um, but that's something like a Corona special that we get for the past half year. Um, mm. I'm not sure if those will keep on coming here after Corona. Well, also you have the uh, you have Cologne, which is also a very big cargo airport, right? Yeah, like Cologne and Leipzig are the two major cargo hubs in all of Germany. Um, mainly because those two airports are the only ones within Germany's uh, accepting flights after midnight. Um, every other airport in Germany, as far as I know at least, um, does not accept any aircraft landings after 23, uh, 11 p.m. for example. Okay. At least some airports have the specification that you are not allowed to plan a flight landing after 11.30 p.m. for example. Um, some airports even say you're not allowed to plan a landing after 11 p.m. Plus, of course, 30 minutes just in case you're having a delay or something. Um, mm-hmm. But at least... As far as I know, every airport shuts down at, uh, at midnight, apart from Cologne at Leipzig. So those can still accept landings at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so that's, for freighters, of course, a major role, because they can like depart or land whenever they want. And that's critical for timing, I guess. So those are the two major cargo hubs within Germany. And currently, those two are the most flown to airports apart from Frankfurt. Um, so it's it's a very key role for those airports. Okay, interesting. Uh, I know there was a lot of noise restrictions and stuff like that, but it's kind of nice that they let they have to keep at least one airport open throughout the night because global call. Co- They're trying to commerce. change it. <laughs> uh, at least the civilization and the, the people living around the airports are of course trying to change it. They want the t- midnight blocking. Well. Uh, we deal with those people here in Boise, but they're like, oh my god, an A-10's so loud. Well, if you've ever been next to an A-10, I don't have to wear hearing protection next to one. And if I don't have to wear hearing protection next to one, it's not that loud. But that's neither here nor there, but global commerce has to go on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's oh God. I've seen I've seen those photos of the of like the cargo light up in Cologne. I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then they got like the really oddball stuff sometimes, like that, uh, like that. Uh, uh, what is it? The the Illusion 62 M. Yeah. That Rada Airways ones that's sitting right there. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a very special aircraft. Very rare. Got it. I, unfortunately, I do not have it. <laughs> I think there's pretty much just one airport in all of Europe that it flies to more often. That's Ostrava. Uh, it's in the east of Europe. Is that one easy to go? I think it's. Take photos at? I think it's seven hours of a drive from Munich, or six hours. So it's nothing that at least I would do just for one aircraft, uh, especially. But for that aircraft, though, I mean, what do you do for that aircraft? Is the only one? Yeah, it's it's, it's almost the question. It's an old former Interflug one, I think, also. Ooh, good question, good question. I would have to Google that. Gotta go get the former airline of East Germany, an old Interflug one while she's still flying. It's, yeah, it's it's a very special aircraft. The question always is, if, if is it worth it to drive 14 hours in just one day for one aircraft? And if you have the time, 
probably yes. I think you can also combine with other AirPods on the drive there, but if you're having to do some work or something, it's probably very, very hard to do it. So that's unfortunate reason why I still can't, can't find that aircraft in my collection. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe one day you'll get lucky and she'll go to Cologne or Munich for, for something, but maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Fingers crossed. But there's also a lot of, there's also, what, noise, noise uh, 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 regulations as well, which I don't think it it it, it, it falls under. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very hard. I mean, Munich, for example, is, is the price you pay for landing is very de dependent on how loud your aircraft is. Um, so as far as I know, there has been very special permissions just for an occasional landing. For example, the Boeing 727, for example, I think that one had a special permission just to land here. Um, or we do have had the Boeing 707 by the Israeli Air Force um, close to Munich. That, for example, was also a very big noise factor, of course. <laughs> I think yeah, that's a little. That's one, that one had a, a special permission as well. Um, so there's a ton of politics involved whenever you want to fly to Germany with a very loud aircraft. Uh, it's always a question who wants to, to allow you to land, who wants to even refuel you, for example. Uh, it's it's tough sometimes, I guess. Yeah, it can be. Well, do you have a least favorite aircraft to take a photo of? Uh, tough question. Probably some something like the, the Antonov 74, um, just because the high wing just annoys me personally, because the photos you take of the aircraft are 50% shadow, because <laughs> the, the big high top wing just blocks so much sun of the of the livery that at least i think that on photos it's it's a very hard aircraft to photograph at least from from side angles and from from beneath when doing a sky shot for example even though it's a very rare and special aircraft on photos it's hmm there's just too much too much shadow <laughs> man i was not expecting that answer very rare Ukrainian built Antonov aircraft as your least favorite aircraft to take a photo of. I was not expecting that. That's probably why you can find out that I'm an aviation photographer, not specifically a plane spotter. Um, I am hunting for perfect pictures. I'm hunting for the perfect shot of an aircraft. And it's, it's that one aircraft that I've never been able to get a photo from that I'm fully satisfied with. That's fair. That is fair enough. All right. Well, what about your favorite aircraft of all time? That's probably a very easy question, just because of the fact that we do have the Munich Security Conference I mentioned earlier. Um, that's something that brings up specials like every year. Um, some years are better, some years are worse, but there's probably always going to be that one aircraft that sticks out from the crowd. And uh, I think 2018 or 17, we had the Burkina Faso 727, which is a very, very special aircraft. Uh, my personally very first and only 727 ever photographed. photographed. And we did also have a Tupolev 154 by the Kyrgyzstan government. Also very cool aircraft that I think those two just probably going to be the coolest aircraft. So you like the, the three-engine S-Ducks then? Yeah, I mean, those are like, when, at what time are you able to take photos of these two aircraft alone? I mean, the 727 is probably going to be completely distinct in all of Europe. I think there are a few ones still flying in the US, if I'm correct. A uh, few in the U.S., and then the majority of them are still in Central and South America. Yeah, so Europe is just, there's none of them. Uh, same for the Tupolev 154, very, very rare aircraft. Um, just the very few Russians still flying them. I think it's now the Russian, mainly the Russian military now, or maybe like a freighter version of one here and there, and then the North Koreans one, but otherwise. Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's still one airline from, from Russia, Alrosa is the name. Uh, they're still flying it commercially. I think they retired or they actually. Oh, I'm hoping. I think they did. I think they did. <laughs> I, th uh, I remember be. reading about that. Maybe. So, very very special to aircraft. But apart from that, there's always something special out of Europe. For example, we did have the, the NASA DC-8 uh, a year ago or two years ago. I love that plane. <laughs> it's, it's a very special plane. Even though it's already flying wrong with the newer um, 737 engines, that kind of ruined the look. But it's still a DC-8. It's still a DC-8. Unfortunately, we drove to, to Ramstein just for that aircraft and the weather was shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also a very special aircraft. So those, I did, I guess the rarer it gets, the more special the plane is to take photos of. So hypothetically, okay, you're at the Munich Security Conference and you're set up for the Tupolev 154's departure. But the 727's about a land and you have to make a decision. 
What are you going for? Are you going for a 7-2 landing? Or are you going for the Tupolev taking off? Tough question. Tough question. Um, I think it's about the photo. Um, both aircraft are awesome. Um, I'd probably go for what I can take the best photo of. Interesting answer. I mean, if it's always depending on where you're standing. Landing might be super cool from where you're standing, but from the same spot, a departure would be very boring. Uh, for example, the touchdown area of a runway, it's an awesome place to be for landing because the touchdown is always awesome with the smoke maybe coming out of the closed area of the wheel, wheel by touching down. But it's like super boring for a takeoff because the aircraft is just mainly static. So I'd probably just go for where I'm standing. Both aircraft are okay. superb and super rare. It's been giving me a lot of interesting answers on this and I love it. Well, what's about the rarest aircraft you've taken a photo of? And I'm assuming it's probably something that has to do with the Munich Security Conference. Probably the two mentioned airplanes. Probably Bu Burkina Faso uh, 727 or the Kyrgyzstan. Both aircrafts. I've never actually seen many photos of those on jet photos or airliners or whatever platform you're looking at. Um, those are probably the rarest catches. So is the 72, is it a... 200 series or a 100 series? Uh, it is a 200 series. Not sure if it's, if it's the advanced one. Um, good question. Was it retrofitted with newer engines or was it still uh, still the old, uh, old ones? Still the old ones. Oh, nice. So I've just Googled it in the meantime. It's, the, it's actually a 727-282W, which I think should be the advanced version. It has version. winglets on it. It has a winglets on it, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that thing, at least for me, that was a very, very special plane, very rare plane, and it was also very, very awesome to spot because it was static on Munich Airport for, I think, two days. Um, so people were able to get awesome night shots, which I'm always a fan of, um, yeah. but standing on the ground, and those were just perfect, perfect pictures. I do love the 727. That is one of my favorite, favorite aircrafts. Of, of all time. It's just so rare, especially in my age of 20 years, it's a plane that you've never used to see. Um, so it's like super special. But I mean, I remember, I actually remember flying on them as a kid, very, very early on as a kid, just a photo of me in a cockpit of a Northwest one. <laughs> so for me, that's, so for me, like the DC-9s and the 7-2s for me are always a special place in my heart. Yeah, it's very cool airplanes. Well, anyway, man, that's pretty awesome. You know, two the two, two the Soviet trijet tri and then the American trijet I think that is that's pretty cool to to, to to do photos of but so what about do you have any favorite events or uh, certain locations that aren't really around airport photography that, that you enjoy going to well that's a pretty special story that I could tell for this one um yeah, yeah it's, absolutely. It's been an awesome privilege. Um, I've, I've been invited, I think, 2017. Yeah, 2017, I was invited by a, a pilot from the Portuguese airline uh, TAP, or FlyTAP, I think that's the correct uh, correct pronunciation. Um, he invited me to, to tag along his flight from Lisbon to Sao Paulo, and enjoyed just both flights within the cockpit. So it's been 20 hours of sitting within the cockpit. Uh, plus minus, I think, half an hour for, for lunch, sitting in the business class. <laughs> um, so that was probably the, the best experience ever for photography. There's been tw awesome 20 hours of just enjoying the work of a pilot and a co-pilot, um, seeing those two interact with each other, seeing those two flying and managing everything around the app, uh, aircraft. And the, the flight back from Sao Paulo to Lisbon is a night flight. So you'll see the sun go down and rise, which is of course the best solution ever for a photo. For a photo. For a photo. Um, just seeing the sun rise through the cockpit windows, which I think that's one of the best views you can ever have. And those was that was probably the best experience I've ever had within aviation photography. Um, just the photos one is able to take within the landing or the departure of an aircraft within the cockpit. It's, it's a very big privilege. I'm very, very thankful for it. Um, big shout out to the captain at, at TRP that was making me able to take those photos. Um, that was very, very special. So that's probably the number one spotting story I can tell. Huh. Um, those were awesome photos. Well, that's a pretty, that is a pretty, pretty cool story. I remember seeing your photos and stuff like that. Um, but kind of just, just wrapping back to the previous question, do you have like a, any air shows you like going to or like anything like that? Um, 
Hmm. It's, it's a diff difficult topic for me because I haven't been to those many air shows. Um, I've been to the, the to the Chicago CNR show 2017 when, when we first met. Um, the show was awesome. The photos, I don't like them, maybe because of my equipment back then. Uh, with 300 millimeters, I just wasn't able to get the shots I wanted. Um, I haven't been to too many European um, air shows. Um, of course, the, the ELR and the Le Air Show Liberté are very, very special. Um, those are awesome. But I think those air shows, just from a photography standpoint, aren't that amazing. Because at the ELR, for example, you would be standing in the north and the planes would be standing, uh, flying in the south. So pretty much every photo is backlit. Uh, yeah. So from a photography standpoint, photos are okay, to say the least. <laughs> But the experience yeah. around is, of course, awesome. Um, so as far as air shows go, I think I just have no chance of um, telling you anything about it. <laughs> um, yeah. I think your experience and probably of the experience of other past uh, people on the show was very superior to mine. Um, the only thing I can tell that I think one of the coolest air shows to say in all of Europe is probably the Mac Loop. Uh, in Great Britain, mm. it's not really an airship, but it's it's a very special place yeah. where the Air Force trains their aircraft. Those shots, I've never been there, but those shots are epic. So yeah. there's a few special things here um, in Europe, but unfortunately, I can't tell too much about them. That's a, I want to get out to the mock loop so bad. I mean, I used to go out to Star Wars Canyon a lot, but now I'm doing my own stuff here in my own backyard. And um, <clears throat> yeah, your photos were awesome from from that spot. Yeah, uh, I do miss Star Wars Canyon, but um, I mean, I miss going out there. I love the scenery. I love taking out out there. But you know, for me, the Star Wars Canyon wasn't the end all be all like some people make it out to be. Uh, I mean, you know, I've I've experienced some other locations with my other friends and all that, and my own locations here in the state of Idaho, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mock. I want to get out to the Mock Loop one day, and hopefully, we can maybe coordinate that. Well. But yeah, back to your tea, your your tap Portugal stuff. Um, I remember I remember seeing your photos. And I was like, God, how the hell did they manage to swing that? <laughs> and I know that. What well, was it? It was on the the the, the new Neo, right? The, the A three thirty nine hundred Neo. Uh, unfortunately, not. It's actually been one of the oldest aircraft the airline still operates. It's been a former Swiss A three thirty. Um, so it's, it's a very, very old aircraft. You, you were able to see that within the cockpit, for example. The old Swiss aircraft used to have an analog watch in there, which is something I haven't seen on too many AP-30s. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a very, very old aircraft. You would be able to see that with looking anywhere within the cockpit, like scratches here and there. Um, so it was an old AP-30-200, but nevertheless, an ex- awesome experience. Um, I, th- I didn't. Oh, absolutely. Don't even think that the knee was a thing back that back then. I think the knee was delivered two years after 2019 or 18. Okay. Oh, history. <laughs> but yeah, at uh-huh. least I know it's it's not been a thing back then when I was able to fly it. That's so cool. You got to do that though. And how did you get back? Did you do the same thing on the way back? Yeah. Um, so it's basically staying with the crew all the time. I flew there, met the crew, and flew with them to Sao Paulo. Luckfully, was able to to take the same crew bus. Uh, Sao Paulo is not the most safe country for a sixteen-year-old uh, flying alone. <laughs> yeah. And I was luckily being able to stay within the crew all the time, even staying in the same crew hotel, um, spending the time at Sao Paulo with them. We had two days to explore the city and get some of the culture to see at least, um, and join the flight back with the same crew. So that was a perfect, uh, perfect trip. That must have been pretty, pretty cool. But anyway, man, uh, this has been a great discussion so far. So let's uh, let's start wrapping her up, man. Do you have any tips, words of encouragement for the listener out there? I'm just gonna mention one thing. I'm I'm, st- I'm stealing this from another photographer from Munich. Um, you might know his work. He's uh, Runway Twenty Six Productions. Um, it's it's uh, Markus Schwab. You probably maybe you've heard his name on on LS and Jet Photos. Um, known for his very famous photos um, of the sunrise in Munich with, with fog all around those uh, aircraft landing. Um, oh, yeah. He's an awesome guy. I'm, I'm very lucky to call him a friend. And he's once told me that if you're standing somewhere completely alone at the airport, you're doing it right. Um, so that's something I always tend to, to work with. Um, he's, of course, is a very big friend of aviation photography, not plane spotting. He's there to take that epic shot, not that perfect registration photo. And 
So he was mentioning that try to do something else, try to take a very specific something else, just try to be creative. Um, not just walk up to the airport, use the same visitor cell everyone else is doing. Um, try to fiddle around the light. For example, you have perfect light from the left, go to the left, try to take a perfect light of the, um, of the close up with the engines lit up or something. So that's something I can recommend to anyone. Um, try to do something else, unless of course you're a plane spotter, then if you're just looking for the perfect registration photo from 90 degrees angle, perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, personally, that that sentence of him was, was a very good motivation to try to get out there and do something else and try to do something that not everyone else is doing. That is, that is great. And I love that, you know, if you're standing alone, you're doing it right. And man, I love standing alone when I take photos. <laughs> I mean, of course, the social aspect of planes is always a thing. Oh, yeah. It's always awesome to, to meet epic people, to hear epic stories, um, to, to talk with people about history, about aviation, or pretty much everything. As far as the photo goes, it's always neat to have a photo that no one else is having. Exactly. So exactly. when you're uploading it to jet photos, you're not having the same photo of the same aircraft the same day at the same second by 50 people. Yep, <laughs> yep. But having that one one photo that just distinguishes itself from everything else. Yeah. And that's something that I was always aiming for, um, still am aiming for when it's possible. Sometimes, of course, it's not just a possible. If the weather is shit anyways, why don't you take the same photo as anyone else? But if you have that perfect sunrise or sunset, why don't try to play with it? Absolutely. That is so well said, Florian. It's so well said. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Completely agree with you. But anyway, dude, so you mentioned another very famous Munich spot, but where can people find your work? You can, of course, just check the, the standard platform I use or have used Instagram very, very often. Um, I am jet spotting on there, and you can also, of course, web, visit my website, which is jetspotting.com, and find probably best my best work on both jet photos and um, my airplane pictures um, with the username being my full name, just Florian Schulenberg. Just check out the website if you want to know anything about me. If you have any questions, you can find a contact form on there. Just hit me up and I'll be happy to help and answer any questions. All right, guys, well, you heard him. Uh, make sure you go give him some love on his uh, social media account and all that. Uh, do you have a Facebook page for your photography, by the way? I do, I do. It's the same name, Jet Spotting, but I'm not that active on there. So maybe give it a like if you want to. If you have any questions, you can hit me up through that. Um, but as work continues to grow, this time for planes will decrease, unfortunately. <laughs> Probably the same issue everyone else is having. Uh, yeah, ad adulting issues. <laughs> but anyway, Florian, that was an amazing discussion. Guys, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed this, this, this discussion as well. Um, just a reminder to you guys... Um, as you probably have seen, I am off Instagram right now, so and I am loving it, by the way. Um, if you guys, honestly, I know I use Instagram a lot to promote this podcast, but taking a little bit of time off social media is so good for, for the mind. I've been so much more productive, and I felt like I've been doing a lot more things instead of sitting on my phone and stuff like that, and I honestly love it. Um, so I really encourage you to take a social media break every so often because it is it is so nice. It really is nice. And plus, I'm not worried about what do I need to post today or if I need to post anything today. Or it, it's it's so nice. I, I highly recommend doing it. But um, I still I will be back on there in a bit. So if you have any questions, uh, you can always shoot me a DM there at Boi Spotter. Uh, please check out the Facebook page, guys. I'm doing a lot more work on the Facebook page, and that is where you're going to see a lot more updates of the podcast is on Facebook as well. Uh, YouTube is always a great tool if you know somebody that doesn't have access to the normal podcast apps or anything like that. Show them to the YouTube page. Another great way to get it out there. And uh, we are starting some merch, guys. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but we might have some merch coming on, and we will keep you updated on how that's going to go. Um, as always, you always can find me on Twitter, at BOI Spotter, and uh, more updates for, for the podcast up there as well. And uh, I do a very special bonus episode coming up on Father's Day. I may just give it away right there, but uh, please stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, we will have a big guest coming on here very soon. I've been Happen up through the couple next ones. It might be the next one. May not be the next one, but we'll uh, you'll you'll know who it is when we drop the episode. So anyway, 
uh, Florian, anything to add before we close her out? Uh, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be on here. Uh, thank you, and forward to seeing you here on the Nurburgring. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. I can't wait to be out there with you, uh, going around the carousel at hopefully a couple, about 100 miles an hour if I don't fly off the rails. But hey, fingers crossed. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for me here on another episode of the Aviation Spotters podcast. And as always, keep those batteries charged and those cameras ready. And we'll catch you on the other episode of the Aviation Spotters podcast. <laughs>